So when I show people my editing and gaming system, most people don't really know what they're looking at. Most people identify it as a DVD player or a hard drive bay or something along those lines. Most people don't identify it as a computer, let alone a full editing and gaming system. And I get it, these assumptions are from those who haven't actually built a PC in their life, but I still feel for those people who have built systems in their life, that when they see a small form factor system like the one behind me, that they associate this uh, smaller space with significant compromise. And uh, I'm gonna show you today that that isn't exactly the case. So today we're going to downsize this fairly typical gaming system that we have here in the S340 Elite, which was a very popular mid-tower enclosure in 2017, and transporting all of the components, or at least the ones that will fit, into the Fractal Design Node 202, which sits at just over 10 liters of volume. This means that it can easily fit into a large backpack, lay nice and flat under your TV, or just give you a lot more desk space to work with. I chose the Node 202 here because it gives you exceptional value for just how optimized it is in terms of space, and for those who want the smallest possible system without spending a fortune, this is definitely what I would recommend. For just $69 US dollars, you get a compact ITX enclosure that can fit a full-length graphics card at just 10.2 liters of volume, a significant reduction from the 41.5 liters of the S340 Elite. Alright, now let's look at the base system that we're working with here, and I understand that some of you may not agree with all of the parts that I've selected here, but just understand that my goal here was to build a system that I thought was a fairly typical gaming system. So seeing as popularity was the goal here, we're going with the Ryzen 5 1600 with the stock cooler, and we're locking that into a B350 motherboard. We've also got a GTX 1060, a 450 watt bronze rated power supply, 250 gigabyte SSD for the operating system and programs, another one terabyte drive for games and that's all sitting inside the S340 Elite from NZXT as we mentioned earlier. And just to reiterate one last time before we move on, this build is not necessarily something that I'm suggesting to you guys, just what I would consider a fairly average cookie cutter gaming build that would be most useful for this video. Okay so let's start transporting the parts over to the Node 202 and look at what we can keep and what we'll need to change. Let's start with the motherboard as this is going to be the biggest change and most expensive one for most people and there's absolutely no way around this as this is something that we do need to downsize as you can see. Now for mainstream chipsets like B350 you'll be able to find a compatible ITX board no problem at all but for high-end chipsets like X399 for Threadripper or X299 for Core i9 systems you won't be in as much luck. Currently there are no X399 ITX boards that exist although that would be pretty cool and there's only one X299 ITX board that I know of from ASRock. And even then, I wouldn't recommend transporting your X299 into an ITX form factor unless you really know what you're doing, as cooling the CPU is going to be the biggest issue. For us though, we're keeping our Ryzen 5 1600 processor and we're going to stick with the B350 chipset. Although do note that X370 ITX motherboards are also available if you want to upgrade and they will be compatible as well. Now, the main compromises of moving to a smaller ITX motherboard is that you'll now only have one PCI Express slot for your graphics card, compared to the three or more that you'll typically find on ATX boards. However, this really isn't an issue for most people, seeing as they're not running a multi-GPU setup or any other PCI Express devices. And with SLI and Crossfire support slowly fading away, this seems like the common trend. Also, depending on which motherboard you buy and how much money you spent, you may experience a lower potential overclock on your CPU by moving to an ITX motherboard. And this is often due to the lower phase count of VRM compared to the larger boards. In our case, we are moving from eight VRM phases down to six VRM phases, so it'll be interesting to see how that affects overclocking. Next up, let's talk about CPU coolers, and this is largely going to depend on which ITX case you go with. The Node 202 has a fairly restrictive CPU cooler height of just 56 millimeters, and that means that even our stock cooler from AMD, the Wraith Spire, will not actually fit. However, if you do go with a wider ITX case like the NCase M1 or Cougar QBX, for example, you can fit a CPU cooler with a height of up to around 130 millimeters, giving you plenty more options, and you can also fit a 200 
140 millimeter liquid all-in-one cooler in these two cases as well using the included side brackets. So to give a couple recommendations, the N-Case M1 works really well with the Noctua D9L with an extra fan and it's actually what I'm using in my personal system. You can also fit a Noctua U9S in there as well which I've heard actually works better. I'm interested to try that one for myself but generally if you're looking at slim small form factor cases like the Node 202 you're probably going to go with either of these the Cryrig C7 or the Noctua L9. From my testing the L9 is much quieter than the C7 but also doesn't perform as well mainly because the heat sink isn't as tall but do note that the L9 does come in a 65 millimeter form factor as well which is highly recommended if your case does fit it. So the plan for the new build was the Cryrig C7 but unfortunately it does not come with the AM4 mounting bracket and that's something that you'll have to purchase separately. So reluctantly I had to resort to the only compatible CPU cooler that I had on hand for this build which just happened to be the Wraith Stealth. But in all honesty guys the Cryrig C7 is definitely going to be the much better option here and if you can get your hands on it along with the AM4 mounting kit then I'd highly recommend it. It's going to be very interesting to see how that Ryzen 5 1600 handles the Wraith Stealth. Also guys if you are working with a KB Lake or a Coffee Lake CPU from Intel it is highly recommended that you delit it if you are serious about the cooling or if you're running into a thermal limit. For those who don't know what this is, this involves removing the heat spreader from the top of the PCB and replacing the stock thermal compound that's already in there with a liquid metal compound such as Thermal Grizzly Conductonaut. You're pretty much guaranteed a drop of at least 10 degrees C with drops of over 15 degrees considered pretty standard. I recently dropped around 13 degrees C on my 8700K with this procedure and I've seen drops close to 20 degrees for other processors like the 7700K and the 8600K. Again, highly recommended if you're going to be running an overclockable 7th or 8th generation Intel CPU in your new small system however we're running a ryzen cpu where the heat spreader and cpu die are actually soldered together so deleting is not necessary all right now let's talk about graphics cards and if you're one of those people who have a full length gpu and that is one of your main priorities i'm one of those people then you are in luck because these small form factor cases are marketed towards gamers with full length gpu support being one of the main priorities so most of the time the only cards that won't fit are the asus strix cards uh, the EVJ for the win three cards and some of the Gigabyte Aorus cards. Otherwise, we have full length GPU support in the NCase M1, uh, the Dan A4, and the Node 202, which we're going to be building in today. The Node 202 allows for a card length of up to 310 millimeters, so this GTX 1060 will have plenty of room in there with its length of 228 millimeters. Another couple of things that you'll want to research regarding your graphics card of choice are both the height and thickness of the card. To give a couple of examples, some of the EVGA and MSI gaming cards are too tall for the NCase M1 and you won't be able to fit it. And regarding thickness, some small form factor cases are limited precisely precisely to a two slot card so make sure you do your research here as well and on the note of blower versus open air cards it really depends on the amount of airflow that your card has access to it's very common to just assume that blower style cards are just going to work much better in a small form factor system seeing as that is the common belief however you'd be very surprised with the results that you can get with an open air cooler for example our node 202 is giving plenty of access to fresh air to our open air gtx 1060 so it's not going to be much of a problem at all on to the next part let's talk about power supplies and if you are moving towards a true small form factor system then this is one part that we have to change as well and we just cannot get around so we will be swapping our ATX unit here for something that fits the SFX form factor unfortunately we do have to spend a little bit more money here as well seeing as SFX power supplies are not as popular and there's not many variants of them this is an area where I do recommend spending the extra money and getting something that is modular so you don't have to bundle up any unwanted cables and that extra 15 or 20 dollars can definitely go a long way i generally like to stick with corsair sf variants being the sf 450 and sf 600 as i've found them to be very nice and quiet but i do also recommend buying from another reputable brand like silverstone and if you're looking to build the most powerful small form factor build ever then look no further because silverstone offer a gold rated 850 watt variant that i would absolutely love to get my hands on 
Okay, enough dreaming. The SF450 from Corsair fits us perfectly well here. It's 80 plus gold rated and fully modular and you can grab it for around 89 US dollars. Now, of course, storage is very important as well. And with M.2 drives becoming more and more popular, I feel that this should be a fairly easy transition for most people. Using an M.2 SSD as your boot drive and then a larger two and a half inch SSD for your main storage, it seems to be a more and more popular strategy for builders today. Day, but our use case has a single two and a half inch SSD paired with a three and a half inch hard drive. And I wanted to show here that it's not just smooth sailing all the time. And in the end, you will have to make a couple compromises. Since our Node 202 here does not support three and a half inch drives, seeing as it's too small, but instead has support for two two and a half inch drives. Most mini ITX cases will have support for one or more three and a half inch drives though. So if that is a priority for you, don't worry because there's plenty more options out there and so for our build we will be swapping the one terabyte three and a half inch drive for a 525 gigabyte ssd and an m.2 drive we are losing quite a bit of capacity at the end of the day but you can always archive some unused files or uninstall some games that you haven't played in a while the other option here would be of course to just invest in another two and a half inch drive with the same capacity but those drives are quite expensive all right, case fans, and if you were over analyzing your direction of airflow and pressure in your ATX mid tower, you can forget about that right now because airflow in mini ITX cases is dead simple. Seeing as the CPU and GPU cores are sitting right against the side panel of our new case, making intakes very easy and the exhaust of hot air will be completely passive. This is true for most of the tiny cases under 15 liters and the access that your components have to fresh air here would surprise most people. In other words, populating your new small form factor system with case fans is going to be nice and simple because most of the time there's only going to be a couple slots and that's it. For the Node 202, there's only two slots for case fans and that's right underneath the graphics card and that's going to help pull in some fresh air. And just a last note on memory, you'll be able to run taller RAM dims like the Dominator Platinum Sticks in pretty much any case that I know of, but your main issue is going to be with your CPU cooler compatibility. So low profile RAM dims like the one we're using here are highly recommended and so here is the finished build a super compact go anywhere and do anything pc we'll be going quite in depth in part two of this little project where we look at thermals acoustic performance and also overclocking that's definitely something that needs its own video and not something that i want to brush over cable management was actually pretty easy and as you can see i'm using these stock corsair cables nothing special here and they can easily be bunched up underneath the power supply and overall the build building experience was just really, really straightforward, seeing as you're working with this bare chassis, which is so easy to work with. The graphics card installation was super easy thanks to that included riser card and the two 120 millimeter fans underneath are providing some fresh air, which should give us some nice thermals. Everything is super compact, just like we had planned guys, and the panels fit on very nicely, giving us our new clean and compact system. As always guys, let me know down below what you guys would do differently and if I messed anything up in terms of compatibility as well. Stay tuned for part two, which is gonna be the uh, in-depth testing for thermals and acoustics and also looking at how the system handles things in general. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and as always, I will see you all in the next one.